started. All right, so today uh, we're gonna do a little bit of a review of quantum field theory two, the whole one, the whole course. But I'll try to present it from a like bigger bird eye, bird's eye point of view, a little bit zoomed out. And then I'll try to tell you guys a little bit about what we'll what we will discuss at the moment, what the plan is for QFT two, in case you're interested, so that there is some sort of coherent picture for for the whole thing. Stop me at any point, please. All right. So we start this course by you talking about the discussing the idea that in the present, if you put together quantum mechanics and relativity, there is you have no choice but you have to allow for pair production. The number of particles in your system is not a well-defined notion if you want both relativity and quantum mechanics to be a thing. Therefore, you're given two choices. You can construct a theory of many part all particles. Your, your, your Hilbert space should include all particles at the same time and allow for transitions between sectors of different number of particles, as we saw in canonical quantization. Or you deal with field theory. You abandon the notion of particles and you talk about fields as fundamental degrees of freedom. Now, taking the point of view of fields has several advantages that we discussed from um, lecture one, but hopefully we saw this throughout the course. First, field theory is intrinsically many body. We saw that it allows for pair production. And more interestingly, it explains antiparticles. We saw in canonical quantization when we were quantizing, when we start quantizing fields, when we had um, complex scalar field, the Phi and Phi dagger were particle antiparticle. When we were dealing with Dirac fermions, we saw there were particles and antiparticles. And we saw that the phenomenon of pair production is about production of simultaneous production of a pair of particle antiparticles. We said throughout the course in several places that field theory is founded on three principles. That was like just to motivate the course. Locality and symmetry. We discussed them in in detail in this course. Then I mentioned renormalization of separation scales. This is the one that I did not discuss as much, and that's going to be discussed in absolute detail, like in, well, in detail in part two of the course. But we saw aspects of it. And um, renormalization has to do with coarse graining. And you know, you you to to discuss renormalization, you should have small fluctuations. This could be, for example, in the context of classical field theory. So, sorry, one little thing. So locality and symmetry are notions that apply to classical field theory as well, right? So you could also talk about the way we presented renormalization in this course. It was a quantum notion, right? But it actually could be classical notion as well. All you need for renormalization is a notion of fluctuations that quantum mechanics allows for, but also Finite temperature physics, finite temperature field theory allows for as well. So if you consider finite temperature field theory as a classical theory, then you have notion of thermal uh, thermal fluctuations and you have coarse graining and renormalization. This is, this is a thing that we're gonna discuss in the next semester. There is another thing, there is another principle that I did not mention at all throughout the course. It's more subtle, it's tricky. It's called the spectrum condition, or in uh, like normal terminology, it's positivity of energy. You want your energy, your Hamiltonian, to have a positive spectrum. Positive as opposed to, well, actually, you don't really need positivity. What you need is boundedness from below. It's the statement that you want your vacuum to be stable. Otherwise, if your energy is not bounded from below, you can always decrease energy right, and go lower into lower and lower energies, and that's, that's instability, right? I'll, I'll comment on these two in the context of classical field theory today to just connect with the ideas a little bit better. Now, something that I didn't discuss at all in this course was that there are various approaches to quantum field theory. Everything we discuss in this course and everything we'll discuss in the next part of the course is going to be only within one framework called Lagrangian formulation of quantum field theory. It's the Lagrangian approach to quantum field theory. 
There are other approaches. There is the constructive quantum field approach where the starting point is Weidman axioms. We'll not discuss that in this course. There is the algebraic quantum approach to quantum field theory where this where we discuss the point of view of representations of observable algebras. These are different approaches. There are also approaches specific to special quantum field theories. There is an approach specific to conformal field theory. These are field theories with larger symmetry group than Poincaré group, the full conformal group. Um, the, the conformal group in D plus one dimensions is SOD plus one comma two. Um, it's just one of those groups that you've worked with, a little bit fancier perhaps. These, these, these field theories are very symmetric and there is another approach called operator product expansion. This, you could axiomatize quantum field theory using operator product expansion. There are also topological quantum field theories. These are theories that don't have local degrees of freedom. There's another approach to understanding them, to defining them, it's called geometric approach in terms of cobordisms and manifolds of various dimensions. And this is formulated in the context of Siegel's axioms. So there are various ways of thinking about quantum field theories and they are, they are related. These are all related. How they are related is an ongoing topic of research. Historic, traditionally, well, when we teach quantum field theory, we teach Lagrangian formulation. But it's crucial to keep in mind these principles I was talking about, locality, symmetry, normalization, and spectrum condition, one way or another are manifest in each of these approaches. I'm just telling you guys because in your future research or like whatever you end up, whatever subfield of physics you end up with, you might come across other approaches to quantum field theory. So you might find yourself a little bit confused as uh, what is the connection. Is this clear? Any any questions? So we'll not discuss these other approaches, but they are ongoing areas of research. They're very powerful, almost Always we think of operator products, but every time we have conformal field theory, almost always we think of operator product expansion. Every time we have topological quantum field theory, we talk, think of geometric approach. They're related, but the relations are just things that are being understood these days. All right. I said that in this course, we talk about Lagrange, the Lagrangian formulation. The key object of interest in the Lagrangian formulation is a functional of the field called the action. This is something that we discuss in detail. Now, let's go through those four principles, three plus one principles of quantum field theory for the action functional. What does it say about the action functional? Locality, we said this in earlier in this course that the um, locality, one manifestation of locality is that the action functional should be an integral over space-time over a density that we call Lagrangian density. This is the notion of locality. Now, this, this Lagrangian density is a function of the field and its derivatives, right? Because we're thinking about Lorentz invariance theories, so this is del mu of phi, space and time derivatives. Good? The notion of normalization one, one manifestation of normalization for this is the following principle, that quantum field theories, as I argued in lecture two, they're supposed to come out in low energy limit, continuum limit of some complicated, say, lattice models. Low energy means expanding in momentum, low momenta. So momenta are small. Written in, as this in language of the functional, it's an expansion in derivatives. Because every time you have a derivative in Fourier space, you get a power of momentum. So del mu of phi has one power of momentum. Del mu of phi squared has two powers of momenta, and so on and so forth. As you go to low, as you go to um, uh, low momenta or low energies, you are what you are doing is you're expanding in del mu of phi. We also said you have to include only terms in this Lagrangian density that are consistent with symmetries. In a sense, the symmetries defined, the symmetries and renormalization and locality define for you the action. So how so? Imagine you have a scalar field. 
you this is a local functional. You're going to expand it order by order in phi and del mu phi. So the first order term has no del mu derivatives. It's a constant. This does nothing. This does not contribute to the coefficients of motion. It just it it's an it contributes as an overall normalization of the path integral that we just said is unphysical. The next order term is a one del mu of phi. This is not consistent with Lorentz symmetry because this is a vector. Lagrangian density, we want to integrate it over space time. It has to be scalar. So the best we could do the next. So you see here here are the principles of symmetry at work. The next order thing you could write down is del mu phi, del mu phi. That respects Lorentz symmetry. Nothing else is allowed. Now, if you break Lorentz symmetry and you say, I want a non-relativistic theory, then there are other terms you could write down. But for Lorentz and theory, this is all that you can write down. Now, there could be higher order terms, but the principle of renormalization tells you that they are suppressed in low energies. We expand in phi, the first order term in phi as something like this. Now, this has a little bit of a problem. We want to drop this. The reason is that because it's proportional to phi, well, one way to say it is that you might have a Z2 symmetry, phi going to minus phi symmetry. But there is a bigger problem with this term. As phi gets large and negative, the potential becomes large and negative. So this is the Lagrangian density. You can calculate the Hamiltonian from it, right? And the, in the Hamiltonian, you learn that this term appears. So for negative and large values of phi, the ham energy could be arbitrarily negative. This term is not good because energy needs to be bounded from below. This is the spectrum condition at work. So you rule this out. The next term is B2 phi 2. This is a mass term that we always include. The higher order terms, we call them interaction terms, right? And that usually we don't talk about higher derivative terms for other reasons that I can discuss, uh, but let's, let's not worry about them for now. Good? So this is the origin of the free theory. The origin of the free theory has to do with do with the following analysis that with the principles that we have, the term that you could write down is basically these two. Now you could eat one of these coefficients in normalization of phi, the other coefficient would be mass. The sign of which is fixed by the by spectrum condition, the fact that you want the energy to be positive. Right? We discuss in more detail the no, the how symmetry helps us understand quantum field theory. We discuss the representation theory of Poincaré group and how it classifies your field content, or in other terms, your particle types, in terms of two variables, spin and mass. This came out of the study of the Lil group, and uh, if you recall. The action to the second order in phi and del mu phi is a free theory, is fixed. And labeling it this way, we end up with a set of free actions for scalars, spinners, and vectors. We did that, right? So for example, in three plus one, the scalar, we wrote down the universal form of it. It was, I can write it in one line, it's a one-liner. Spinners, we said that in three plus one dimensions, we study the representation theory. We saw spin as half integer and has to do with the representation theory of two copies of um, SU2, right? Vector, so the half, half left, spin half for left, and uh, spin zero for right is a chiral fermion. Spin zero left, spin uh, half right is another chiral fermion. We talked about half left, half right, representation, which is a bunch of vectors, Lorentz vectors. We talked about Dirac uh, spinners and all that story. We said that in the case of M equals zero, the representation theory is more subtle. 
And uh, this was the issue of, for example, massless, uh, massless vector field has only two degrees of freedom, whereas massive vector fields have three degrees of freedom, right? This is a crucial fact that in photon, you cannot have a um, mode in the direction of the propagation. The modes have to be always perpendicular to propagation. Any questions so far? We discussed consequences of symmetry. This was a connection between differentiable symmetries, Lie algebras, right? And sorry, differentiable symmetries of the action, conservation laws, and the mathematical formulation of representations of Lie algebras and Lie groups. We said that in physics, symmetries are, Wigner's theorem tells you that symmetries are represented using unitaries and anti-unitaries on the Hilbert space. We said that Noether's first theorem tells you that to every symmetry there exists, you can associate conservation law, right? So there are conserved charges. And then we said that conserved charges satisfy the Lie algebra brackets, proper, uh, commutators. We also talked about models, systems where there are no, they're not, they don't have a global symmetry, but they have gauge constraints, they have gauge redundancies. Then there is another second theorem that gives you, instead of conservation laws, it gives you constraints or otherwise known as ward identities. We explained by example how gauge theories arise in the infrared from lattice models. We also gave a geometric description of gauge theories in terms of five principal bundles. The action we wrote down for um, gauge theory was very natural. It was simply the curvature of the connection that we needed to define. Any questions about this part? So, I'm just doing a very quick review of everything we've discussed uh, up until now, all put together, right? So we start with action principle. It had to be local. It had to respect the symmetries. It had to be lowest order in derivatives. Then we looked at the representation theory that fixed for us the particle types. We talked about, uh, we in particular, we talked about scalars, uh, spinners, spin half mostly, and then spin one, or spin one, which are vectors, right? Now, um, we talked about the connection between global symmetries and their, the consequence of global symmetry. We talked about consequences of gauge invariance, gauge redundancies. Good. Uh, one question. Yes. Uh, in, our, in our analysis of like gauge theory still now, we haven't uh, really talked about the fiber bundle structure for gauge theories. Is that is it because our analysis is too basic and we don't need that extra technology? No, no. Like we, the, we, we did talk about the fiber bundle story we talked about was- Like you didn't explicitly mention it. We didn't explicitly mention like the fiber bundle structure, so to say. We just uh, used, like, does it make sense sorry. what I'm asking? No, sorry, so, so, uh, say it again. What was the question? Like in our analysis, you never really explicitly mentioned that uh, we're using fiber bundles, so to say. Are you asking quantization within use it? Quantization, yeah, in that sense. Ah, ah, yeah, sure, sure. Yes, in quantization, we did not use it, correct. But at a classical mm -hmm. level, we mm -hmm. motivated the action, the Yang-Mills action, mm -hmm. and the, why, the raison d'etre of like why they exist using geometry, right? Like we, we provided a very geometric picture for them. The quantization part, we just did not use any of that, correct? Uh, okay, so is it possible, is it not possible to use the uh, geometric part in that or is it just too complicated at this, so to say? No, no, it's not, it's not complicated really. It, I think I think people do discuss it, but it lies beyond my field of expertise, so mm -hmm. I do not know much about it. People do discuss 
Well, okay, so there are there are phenomena, there are quantum phenomena that engage theories that are more naturally explained in the language of this geometric this geometric language. Okay. Thank you. There, there's quite a lot actually, but I do not I, off the top of my head I can't think of like I'm not an expert in that field. Okay. Any other questions? Then in the second part of the course, we started quantizing. So we canonically quantize scalars, Dirac spinners, and U1 gauge fields. U1 gauge, gauge fields had to be massless, right? So U1 gauge field is a model for photons. Canonical quantization means treating space and time differently. You take a Cauchy slice, a constant time slice, and then you quantize your fields for fixed time, and then the evolution operator tells you how the field evolves. Those A and A daggers that we defined were defined at a particular time, t equals zero, for instance. And then under time evolution, they just take e to the power of i omega t and e to minus i omega t. They just evolve by phases. In canonical quantization, quantum field theory is simply a bunch of bosonic and fermionic simple harmonic oscillators. It's a very simple thing. Right? It's just a collection of decoupled, free field theory is a collection of decoupled simple harmonic oscillators. Now, bosonic field theory, bosonic uh, harmonic oscillators for where you have it when you have a field of integer spin, fermionic harmonic oscillator when you have a field of um, half integer spin. This was the spin statistics theorem that we said every time the spin is half integer, the statistics is they're anti-commuting. The operators are anti-commuting, right? So they're fermion, so fermionic. And every time it's integer, they're commuting variables. So they're sorry. You the algebra A and A dagger, the commutator of A dagger and A is non-trivial. Whereas for half integer, the anti-commutator C and C dagger is non-trivial. This was the spin statistics theorem. Do you guys recall what did we use to Prove the spin statistics theorem. What was the principle that was used? Causality. Causality, yes. Beautiful. An important thing that came out of the study that we, uh, of canonical quantization or quantization of free fields was the notion of a propagator. This is the basically the two point function, right? Um, it's related to the two-point function. And um, the propagator, if you call in momentum space, had this simple form for scalar field was one over P squared minus M squared. Um, and um, we talked about the advanced propagator, retarded propagator, Feynman propagator as different ways of performing the P zero integral, deforming the contour. We saw that the propagator in time, it oscillates and in space, it decays. In particular, we saw that in massive free, field, massive free fields, it decays exponentially fast at long distance with an exponent that's controlled by M. That is the very, in a sense, that's a very definition of mass. Mass, if you have, your system shows a mass, it is massive if your correlators at very, very long distances, they cluster. Cluster means that the connected piece of the correlator decays to zero, and it decays exponentially fast. The exponent would be mass, otherwise known as inverse correlation length. Good. We introduce path integrals as an alternative and more covariant route to quantization. Because path integrals didn't quite require splitting the, yeah, it was it was more covariant intrinsically. We uh, one question about yes. uh, these free, free field theories. Yeah. Uh, are uh, do free field theories have problems with the normalization, or are they always? Yeah, we saw that. Yes. 
path integrals, they, they blow up, right? There were infinities in the path integrals of free field theory. Okay. Yes. So uh, do the same restrictions. Okay, so uh, you had mentioned sometimes the interactive, uh, renormalization states that interactive field theory is like, only can have limited powers of like, for example, like only have five, four theories and so on and so forth. So do, do does renormalization place restrictions on free field theories? No. So, all right. Um, free field theories come with divergences in their, in their path integrals, right? But those divergences, they contribute to an overall factor that we basically throw out. So the two-point function, for instance, is not defined using a path integral, but it's defined as a path integral with two operator insertion divided with the path by the path integral with no insertions. Mm -hmm. So it's the normalization of the path integral that formally blows up. This is not the issue of renormalization. The issue of renormalization is more subtle. This has to do with the fact that there are infinite number of modes, right? But the infinity of the number of modes is just the same for all correlation functions. In a sense, it's like, imagine when we talked about vectors in the Hilbert space, right? The physics of a vector in the Hilbert space is a ray. Right? If you take a vector in Hilbert space and multiply by large number or small number, there's no physics associated with that. This divergence that we see in free field theory is like multiplying a vector by a large number. You just have to normalize it. Now, that large number have, turns out to be infinity. The issue with renormalization of interacting theory was that it's actually the coupling constants that need to change, right? So coupling constants were running and changing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good. And that has to do with the fact that this infinity of modes, they appear in the loop calculations for, for example, your three-point functions, right? When we calculated this uh, simple, diagram, right? This is, this diagram is the electric field, uh, electric charge, uh, proportional to electric charge, right? There was this one loop contribution. And here, there was like an infinity of modes that were running in here. And this infinity, in this loop contributes to this guy differently than loops in other diagrams. Whereas the infinities in free field theory just are just universally there and they're multiplying everything. There were no couplings to be renormalized. Well, actually, I'm lying a little bit. I'm lying a little bit. Um, mass does get renormalized. Because mass is a form of coupling. Mass is a coupling. Yeah, that is going to be my next question. As to, as to does mass get renormalized or yes. not? Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna see in the next uh, part two of the course that mass is an is always a relevant mode that grows in the infrared. So it just grows. It gets bigger and bigger as we go to lower and lower energies. Because it's a coupling. Good. And yes. Any other Thank questions? You. We set up Feynman rules as a formal perturbation theory for small non-Gaussianities. Non-Gaussianity means that the, uh, the free theory was phi squared plus del phi squared. That's second order in field is Gaussian. That's why we could do these integrals, right? The path integral we could perform because it was a bunch of Gaussian integrals. The moment you have non-small couplings like this, these are non-Gaussianities and assuming that they're small, which I do warn you guys, what is small, only a dimensionless thing could be small, right? So I explained, and when we're discussing the uh, 
approximation, I explained what is the dimensionless thing that's small, right? If you guys recall, it's the uh, contribution of this term to the action in units of h bar that has to be small compared to the uh, contribution of the free action. We, we define transition amplitudes, scattering matrices, and cross sections as asymptotic observables of quantum field theory. We also talked about correlation functions as other observables of quantum field theory. Then we discussed how correlation functions and amplitudes are related. That was LSC. So the poles of the correlate, well, okay, I, I will not repeat that. We took quantum electrodynamics as a simple example of a relevant field theory for nature. This is a theory of electromagnetism coupled to well, charged particles, electron, for instance. It has a direct spinner, for example, electron, coupled to a U1 gauge field, photon field. And we compute the Feynman diagrams at one loop. One loop means order E squared, right? Because a loop always comes, well, okay. <laughs> this is for the interactions, for the interaction term. Let me not say this at one loop, because that comment might be confusing. We saw, we discovered both infrared and ultraviolet divergences. We said that infrared divergences could be explained with the finite precision of our measurement devices, whereas the ultraviolet divergences will be explained using renormalization. We briefly discussed what renormalization meant within the context of QED at one loop, it meant that the parameters you put in the Lagrangians have nothing to do with physical observables. They're actually infinitely smaller than the physical observables. And renormalization was eating those infinities into the re redefining these bare parameters to be, make them physical. Okay. So this was my very, very quick summary of QFT1. Are there any questions? For the rest, I'll just have a short discussion of what we'll cover in QFT2. Uh, you mentioned uh, this question came up before uh, during the course, but I didn't really understand what, what you said then. So uh, is... Uh, but uh, it's like renormalization, does it only arise because we are uh, analyzing a theories perturbatively or is it fundamental to theory, so to say? Or like, like would it arise, would the notion of renormalization arise if we just did a non-perturbative analysis of the apart quantum field theories? So the short answer is that non-perturbatively also exists, but there is a subtlety. You first have to define non-perturbative quantum field theory. That's a challenge. So you could say, I'm going to define it using the path integral formalism. Then renormalization says the following. Inside the path integral, you're going to put as a measure e to the power of minus s phi. That action will have a bunch of bare parameters. Comes out of this path integral, this generating functional, a bunch of calculations of higher point functions that will be related to the physical parameters, physical couplings. And physical couplings, their relation to this, those parameters, bare parameters in Lagrangian, will be renormalization. Right? Now, of course, there will be running, meaning that you renormalize deep in the IR or UV, Right? As you change the scale, the couplings change. Right? So the renormalization will be scale dependent. 
That will be the running of couplings. But we'll discuss all of this uh, in the next part. The big challenge being that non-perturbatively, we can write down a path integral, but it's just <laughs> it's hopeless in a sense, right? You could try to it's put it in a lattice, and that's what we do a lot. Okay. But it's just very difficult. But the notion of non-perturbative renormalization exists. And there are non well, actually, when <laughs> in part two of the course, you're gonna see there are some non-perturbative methods that allow you actually sometimes say something non-perturbative about renormalization group flow. That's going to be a huge part of part two of the course. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, and uh, can we capture all facets of like our quantum field theories through perturbation or are there some genuinely non-perturbative effects? So to Definitely say? not. Okay. Definitely not. As a matter of fact, perturbation theory in quantum field theory is uh, called, uh, is often asymptotic, almost always asymptotic. Do you guys know what that means? It uh, doesn't converge, the perturbation does not series. converge. So you work so hard to go to higher loops and at some point calculating more loops, the number instead of getting closer to the reality is just gonna grow. So it's only sensible to a certain number of loops. Um, it's asymptotic and it has to, the reason for that is that if you, as you go to higher and higher loops, what you have in mind is that you are calculating the answer more and more accurately. But even perturbative, Quantum field theory has non perturbative corrections. And if you try to calculate the perturbative thing too accurately, you're going to get into trouble with the fact that at some point you're trying to push, get, push it past the point that the size of the non perturbative corrections. And then that kills you. That kills you. But in a sense, even perturbation theory, if you want to ask questions very accurately, you need non-perturbative effects. There's a beautiful story in quantum field theory called Resurgence about how perturbative series secretly know about non-perturbative contributions, blah, blah, blah. A lot of these are like fields that are, you know, like under construction these days. There's, these are active areas of research in quantum field theory. Any other questions? Uh, at the beginning of the course, uh, I asked uh, whether the quantum field theory can reduce to quantum mechanics. Yes. You said that, yes, uh, because quantum mechanics is zero plus one the quantum field theory. Yes. And, uh, um, I was wondering, uh, there are, uh, in what sense is quantum mechanics a zero plus one D quantum field theory because uh, we see that uh, the operators in the quantum mechanics have very different interpretation with the uh, operators in the quantum uh, the field operator in the quantum field theory. No, no, for no, example, this, this is a, uh, go go ahead, go ahead. Ah, uh, yeah. For, for example, we most of the uh, he, for example Heisenberg operators we care about are observables, but in quantum field theory. Uh, these fields are not uh, often treated as observables uh, themselves. So you, correlation functions are observables, right? So yes. It's, it's a similar thing in quantum field theory as well. Correlation, as, as a matter of fact, here, here is a very simple way of going in between the two. Take quantum field theory on a compact space, for example, sphere. Take it, make it simple, uh, circle. So you have one plus one dimensional quantum field theory and a circle times time, right? Now you have a field that lives on a circle. Do a Fourier transform of the field. There will be the zero mode, which is the mode, the constant piece of the field, the part that's like the, the zero mode, right? The field integrated around the whole thing. If you reduce your dynamics to the zero mode, that's just a quantum mechanical system. That's just zero plus one dimensional system. Now it is with the issue with you know qu quantum mechanics is quantum field theory in zero plus one dimensions. The main issue is the following: that because 
the power of quantum field theory comes from locality and symmetry. In zero plus one dimensions, these are very weak. Symmetry is almost, there, there isn't much, right? There's only time translations, which is existence of a Hamiltonian. Lorentz invariance is not there. So if you try to write down a Hamiltonian for a quantum mechanical system, a zero plus one dimensional theory, there are so many terms that are allowed, right? There's no way of ruling them out. But for 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 even for quantum mechanics, you could define S matrices. You can define correlation functions as we do. We can relate the two. It's just uh, that but it's very you lose your power. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, like for example, the uh, statistical interpretation of we of quantum mechanics can we reproduce that using the principles of quantum? No, why 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 we reproduce it? When I you see, as a quantum mechanical system, QFT also has the same statistical interpretation. There's no absolutely no difference, right? It's, if you wish, it's a generalization of the good old thing that you knew about to higher dimensions. Um, yeah, there is like there is a notion of measurement in quantum field theory. There is like amplitudes, probabilities, all of that. It's just it's just that in quantum field theory. Turns out that it's more elegant to formulate things in weak coupling. It's more elegant to formulate things in terms of cross sections. So, if you want to know exactly, like I think I invite you to think about when we discuss path integrals, we start with quantum mechanics, right? Anything that we could do in quantum mechanics, I, I we went through it was a whole lecture, right? Anything in quantum mechanics you ever wanted to know. Matrix elements, everything. We wrote them in terms of path integrals. That's the that was step one, right? So that is a clean presentation or establishing that quantum mechanics is zero plus one dimensional quantum field theory. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good. Yeah, of course. Anything else? Um, is there a any decent physical interpretation of what the field operators actually are, or, or are they just auxiliary functions to help calculations? Like, as in, like we can interpret the wave function as like a, as sort of like related to probability, but the field operators seem further removed from that. No, why? No, no, no. If you have, so take a field operator, phi of x. Well, first of all, it's not an operator; it's an operator kernel. It's like an op. It's a it's, a, it's an operator value distribution. Integrated against a smooth function, you get an operator, right? If you take that operator and act with it on the vacuum, what do you get? You get a one particle state with a wave function, whose wave function is precisely the function you integrated again, phi with it against. So this is one, okay, it's, you won't, you won't, because field theory is so fundamental, you're not gonna explain it related intuitively to something else that you know about, right? But in certain regimes, you can relate it, right? For example, the one particle sector is just, that, that's why I, like, I was insisting a lot on one particle sector. In the one particle sector, it becomes very intuitive. But beyond the one particle sector, things get, yeah, it's, it's not intuitive. These are the observables. These are the observables of the theory. There isn't anything else in a sense. It takes, it's, field theory is radical. It's a radical departure. You know, like the, you're sort of getting to the bottom of the fact that fields are fundamental and all the other things that you've heard about are only true in certain regimes. Just like, I, 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 it is an important concept to know that the electrons, like in this computer right in front of me, and the electrons in the Andromeda galaxy, they are not separate entities in quantum field theory. They are, there is an excitation of the field that has a bump here and a bump there. <laughs> it's just one thing. There is, yeah, there are indistinguishable particles. If, if you don't view it, it's actually the field picture that explains why they're indistinguishable. That's a highly quantum mechanical thing, right? There is no way of saying this particle versus that particle. 
if you exchange them in a hypothetical exchange them, there's no way you would, no, no measurement can ever tell them apart, right? This is the field picture. It's not supposed, to, I mean, I, I, in my opinion, it's not very intuitive, but it is truth. <laughs> it's the truth. That's how nature works. You have to depart, say bye to sit on this like boat of quantum mechanics and just drift off the shore and just say all your intuition goes away because like you're, you're going to this, this abstract world, but all the experiments uh, match this, not our intuition. The world is not classical, right? Good. Any other question? Okay. So what's going to be in part two of quantum field theory? Of course, this is up to change, up to us to decide, but this is what the way that I've scared, planned it so far is uh, something like this. Systematics of renormalization. I want to do renormalization systematically, and that's often part of like a core topic that's covered in part two of quantum field theory. So doing renormalization perturbatively, very, very systematically, I'll probably do some non-perturbative uh, renormalization exact RG, so-called exact RG as well. Quantization of non-abelian gauge theories. So we discussed in detail quantization of uh, U1 gauge theories. That was a, in the context of QED. SU2 is a non-abelian gauge group. The quantizing it comes with stone subtlety, subtleties. And this is a theory of nature called quantum chromodynamics. It's the strong nuclear force. SU3, sorry, I said SU2. My bad, SU3. SU2 is another example. It's the electroweak, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's the electroweak symmetry group. It's a weak force. And then the full group that of standard model particle physics is SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. So we're gonna discuss all of that, right? It's all a gauge theory. It's all a gauge theory. Now, something that funny that happens is that when we get all the way up to here, we realize that because we describe the whole everything in nature in <laughs> in, um, in standard model particle physics, there's no room for masses. Gauge theory forbids masses. You can't have a mass term. Nothing can be massive. So the question you see, this is rest mass. You could have binding energy. In relativity, there is no distinction between energy and mass, right? But you can't have rest mass for single particles. There is a mechanism called spontaneous symmetry breaking through this thing, particle called Higgs particle that was introduced, was suggested back in the 60s when I took, when I was in grad school, it was still taught as like a mechanism, hypothetical mechanism. Now we know it's true, right? And the Higgs particle has been discovered. That this Higgs particle gives all particles in nature, in Santa Mola particle physics, their rest masses. There's a subtlety here. Actual things around us, like a proton and other other stuff, matter that we're surrounded with. The part of the mass of this stuff that comes from the interaction with Higgs is tiny. It's about 1% or something. Most of it is actually the binding energies of QCD, but that that's a, that's irrelevant to the story. We still would have, a, in, in standard model particle physics, we know that there are masses for particles and we can't explain them using Higgs. Yeah, but without, without Higgs, without spontaneous image breaking. Finally, part two of the course will in, include a discussion of non-perturbative methods. So I'm pretty sure I will go through the first three I listed here, but this is this is really up to us to decide what we want to cover. We're gonna try. I'm gonna try to cover anomalies. Anomalies are um, situations where you have a classical, you have a symmetry of the action, classical action, that you could not preserve as a quantum symmetry. I commented on this, and when we were trying to Deal, we're dealing with gauge theories. We're trying to, I said that we do dimensional regularization because we want to regulate the theory preserving the gauge invariance. I also said that if you have global symmetries, your regulator must preserve it. 
Anomalies are situations where there exists no way of regulating the theory, preserving the symmetry. And that's actually a fundamental thing. It's not just like, oh, it's, it's not a subtlety. It's a fundamental thing. Those are classical symmetries that could not exist in quantum mechanics. It leads to the notion of anomalies. And notion of anomalies are actually, there's a beautiful story of it because anomalies are often... Anomalies lead to things called anomaly matching. There, it introduces a whole bunch of techniques and tricks that are fully non-perturbative. Anomaly matching is sometimes how we know about there are these hypothetical dualities between quantum field theories, really crazy quantum field theories. One of them is strongly coupled, the other one is really coupled. We can't do calculations, but we secretly know we can test them non-perturbatively by matching their anomalies. There are these, these are really beautiful techniques in quantum field theory. There's this like world of mysteries that you just have a tiny clue about and you can check it, right? There are instantons. Instantons are, um, this is like an important part of defining what the theory is non-perturbatively. There are large N methods. Large N methods are uh, setups where you, um, so, okay, um, the core idea is something like this in perturbation theory, what we could, what we were doing was that we had a Gaussian, we, we had the, the free theory was Gaussian, and then there were small non-Gaussians around it. N here is the number of particles. Like, for example, this could be SUN, the number of degrees of freedom. In the limit of n being very very large, something like the law of large number kicks in, and no, and you naturally end up with Gaussian distributions. These are this is another free limit. It's not free really. Gaussian limit and large n. This is it's a long story. It's related to uh, quantum gravity. It's related to a lot of things. It was originally dis discussed as a non-perturbative method, and then finally operator product expansion is uh, something that we're going to try to include. We'll see how far we get in this uh, endeavor. All right, so this is what I've prepared. We're at the end of this um, course. And um, let me just say that there was a problem in the last homework that I posted that was repeated. Good for you guys. <laughs> so you have one less problem to solve. The problems are due on Saturday night. And uh, yeah, so that's it. Are there any questions about the course? I hope uh, you leaving guys... aside uh, issues of like renormalization and convergence and stuff like that, does the perturbative analysis we've done throughout this course that we yeah. did in three plus one dimensions, can we do it in d plus one dimensions? Um, yes. Yes, but the story really, well, when we do is when we start talking about systematics of renormalization, we're initially going to just zoom out and talk about arbitrary dimensions. One of the very first things we're going to do is that. And then we're going to see that in lower dimensions, one plus one dimension, the lower dimensions, like one, zero plus one, one plus one, theories are renormalizable. Sometimes even finite, divergent, infinity free. Those are super renormalizable theories. As we go to higher dimensions, it gets worse and worse. And I, I think I argued for this, right? Just just by like, you, dimension counting, you can argue for that. Mm -hmm. He didn't mention that, yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, is so the the forces we we like just mentioned are all like their their gauge groups are all V groups. That they're all like continuous. Yes. Um, but when we talked about lattice models, it was like discrete groups. It was like Z two and things like that. Uh, is there is there any major physical like consequence between having discrete or continuous gauge groups? No, no, sorry, sorry. Lattice lattice models do have continuous groups as well. Recall okay. what we had. What we had the Roder model, the so called Heisenberger Roder model, where at each site you put a vector. Right. So. It's like that. That's actually a picture of uh, 
that's a fiber bundle. That's a discretized fiber bundle for you. At each point, you have this like internal manifold that's compact. Sorry, you were saying I interrupted you. Um. Yeah. Well, just like, is there, is there any major physical differences between having your gauge group be like a lead group like SU two or just like a discrete group like D four or something? Um. So discrete symmetries and continuous symmetries um, are, for the most part, they're very similar, but of course, let's see, how do I wanna say this? You could, well, okay. So you could, you could talk about gauging, having a gauge theory for discrete group. You could talk about that, no problem. Um, it actually happens in modeling nature. What also I want to say, um, often discrete symmetries are harder to detect or like violate. They're harder to discuss. There are some discrete symmetries about the standard model of particle physics that we still, or simple generalizations thereof that are still up for, have not been settled. We know about all the continuous symmetries of standard model, right? Of course. But the, some of the discrete ones are subtle. Um, Sorry, I, I'm not sure if I answered your question. So we did not discuss we when we talked about when we talked about uh, Noder's current Noder's thing, we focus on Lie groups because they have more structure and they're more they lead to very strong statements. But we could discuss discrete groups as well, and often the techniques are less powerful. We did not cover them here. Yeah, that, like, that like I know for like regular symmetries, like the difference between continuous translational symmetry versus discrete translational yeah. symmetry is the difference between conserving momentum or just having quasi momentum. Yeah. Um, but like, does when you move instead of like actual real symmetries to gauge redundancies, does it just like slightly change what const gauge constraint you have? Essentially, like, I, I was just sort of vaguely wondering if it was a big deal or not. Maybe I don't I don't yeah, I don't know enough to answer that question uh properly. I can't do justice to that. Like I have to read and come back to you with a good better answer. Off the top of my head, I don't have anything intelligent to say. Yeah, I know that people I've heard talks about gauging discrete symmetries. There was a talk in Princeton I heard two days ago, yesterday actually about this. But um yeah. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's, it's not a topic I know much about. Yeah. Okay. Right, thank you. I was just wondering because I had also heard about like the, I, I forget whether, I think it was Continuum or something has been doing their experiments to, to gauge various discrete groups. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Sorry. Anna, are, are there any other physics questions? So Arnan, I just want to thank you guys for the whole semester. It was sorry that it was somewhat of a chaotic semester. I was traveling a lot, and a lot of these, some of these lectures were prepared in suboptimal situations and airports and different places. But it was a crazy semester for me, but I've had plenty of fun. I hope you guys at least had some fun and learned some stuff. And I hope I managed to at least send across. This message, the quantum field theory is a beautiful, beautiful topic. It's one of the uh, most accurate theories mankind has ever constructed and is a never ending source of mysteries and questions. And it's a topic under, it's work under, it's, it's in construction. It's in construction. The whole story I'm telling you is what I've learned throughout my career, which is a tiny bit of what people know, which is a tiny bit of what's out there in a sense, because a lot of the questions are remain open and unanswered. Um, having said that, um, yeah, I, I had one more thing to say. Anyway, no, I don't, I don't, I don't recall. Thank you so much. That That's basically um, all I wanted to say. And uh, do you guys have any, oh, uh, if you have any feedback, because this, what I did was somewhat experimental teaching half of, free field theory, the first half, 
Um, if you have any feedback, let me know either by personally contacting me or in this like whatever course evaluations, I'll be happy to get uh, any feedback eventually. Um, hopefully the next time I teach this, it will be better. Any comments, last things? Uh, one question. Uh... QFT2, uh, will that also be over Zoom or will that be in no, person? No, it will be in person. It will be 100% okay. in person. Okay. Now, this was a very strange semester, so it was, yeah, there will not be any lectures and so it will be on, all in person. Uh, so, but uh, will those be recorded or will those will be? I'll try to record them. Okay. okay. Which reminds me, 